If you got all the things that you want, would it make you happy? If the sun only shone, would you know how to cope with the cold? If money were leaves and could grow on trees, we'd bag it all up for the broken things. Would you still be out there searching for gold? And I never imagined a world with no passion, nothing to feed our soul. No, give me a heartache, a brick wall, and I'll break it down. And I'll be coming up stronger than before. All right. Thank you. So most of the biggest and craziest and best parts of my career have all come from me being thrown into a situation when I wasn't prepared for it. Not even a little bit. And I had to adapt quickly. And the funny thing is, uh, each time this happened, I realized it's actually my choice to be thrown in, which is wild, and I wish I learned that a long time ago. But let me take you back for a second. So 2003, I finished my high school studies, and I went to university, and I studied school teaching, believe it or not. And I finished that degree, but throughout my whole tertiary studies, I was gigging. I was playing live music, I was playing in bands, I was playing bass guitar, I was playing some drums, I was singing or pretending to sing, and uh, having a great time. We're playing at parties and all that sort of thing. And when I finished my degree, I'd actually managed to pay off my entire debt, all but six dollars. Something happened. <laughs> and weirdly enough, <laughs> I'm not going to go on on this topic, but it took me years to pay that six dollars off because there was a protocol involved. But I paid off my six dollar debt <laughs> eventually. And yeah, that's right. Big cheers. So uh, I was presented with a choice at this point. I had a bachelor in my hand and I'd been playing music for the last handful of years. And what do I do? Do I continue doing music or do I take this fresh bachelor and do I become a school teacher? And for me, at that point, the decision was obvious. I don't know why it had taken me so long to decide, but of course, <laughs> here we are. Uh, I, I followed through with music. And I did do a little teaching, but uh, the rest is kind of history. So um, fast forward then to around 2011. I'd been playing music for a long time. I'm just going to throw this guitar here because I'm used to being on stage with a guitar in front of me. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know, it's cute. <laughs> um, this is a regular size guitar as well. I'm huge. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, point is, 2011, I'd been a musician for quite a while. At this point, I was married and uh, we're thinking about having kids. And a lot of my friends at this point were, oh, I used to be in a band, but then we had kids and bought a house. And so, you know, etc. And I wanted to be the guy that, that didn't have that same story. I wanted to have all of those things, but I didn't want to have that same story. And so I kept doubling down on my musical career. Um, but at this point, I was playing a lot of covers gigs, a lot of songs that weren't mine, that were big hits, that were favorites in the dive bars that I was performing in. And so in 2011, I was at a music festival called the Gimpy Music Muster in Australia, and I was playing in a blues tent that's similar to this venue. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wildly different, but a great spot. So I was performing here, and I met a Nashville producer, and ironically, he was from Australia. And we got talking, and he said, have you thought much about doing co-writing, writing with other people? And at that point, I'd done a little, but I'd kind of, you know, I've, I was making an income, a uh, decent income playing covers gigs, and I never really thought about my own stuff much. I'd just put out an EP, and that was kind of floating around and doing stuff. But at the end of 2011, we kind of agreed, high-fived, and I booked some flights and flew over to Nashville right here. And I wrote uh, the first few songs that I'd ever co-written with anybody and had an amazing experience. And meanwhile, uh, back in Australia, I was kind of trying to keep the flames alight, musically, so to speak. Whereas I noticed every time I came over to Nashville, I came over to the US, I fit in a little more. You see, in Australia, uh, the music scene's incredible, 
But if you don't fit in a specific square or a pigeonhole or a lane, then it's really difficult to get your music across. And so I felt like I was what they call swinging between all the genres. And that's, uh, I like R&B songs and pop songs and country songs, singer, songwriter, and I kind of don't want to pick one, you know? So there I was in uh, 2015, and I was back and forth from Nashville to Australia in the previous years. And we had a daughter at this stage. And my wife was uh, pregnant with my soon-to-be son. We didn't know what we were getting. Fingers crossed. <laughs> As a boy. So uh, we were talking about it. And the decision to, uh, to continue in Australia or to move to Nashville was so obvious, even though my wife is very intuitive and ev- easily the most supportive person <laughs> in my life, as is the rest of my family, it was so obvious that she said it to me. We should move to Nashville because it makes sense, right? The decision was so ridiculously obvious. So in uh, 2016, which was one year later, we'd set a date. We had a one-way flight, four of them. (laughs) We bought 10 bags from Australia and we landed in Nashville, Tennessee. And I was supposed to have heaps of shows booked because for the previous six months, I was working with a guy over here wasn't malicious or any, any of that, but just circumstantially, the whole situation fell very quickly. And when we landed in the country, I had two kids. I had an 18-month-old boy and a three-year-old girl and a very supportive wife and no gigs, no income, no furniture, nothing. So I was kind of freaking out, right? Because that's what you do <laughs> when you have to support a family on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, some kind of a wage. And, uh, and so what I did was double down on my, on my old school covers knowledge and I approached all the bars that I could and all the friends that I could and anybody that I met in the industry and said, hey man, give me a gig. And even though I was out of my comfort zone in the location, I knew I could tap into the knowledge that I had and the comfortability that I had in my skills and my existing knowledge in the music career. And so that's what I did. So... Funnily enough, I'd been live looping for a few years. I'm going to give you a quick little demo of exactly what that is. So let's do that and we'll come back and talk about it. Still in tune? Close enough. All right. Let's just do some kind of random beat. Somebody say, somebody shout out happy or sad. Happy, all right, happy. Somebody go like upbeat or chill? Chill, well, it's a bit of both. <laughs> let's, do, let's do a little bit of a chill and then we'll, we'll work into one upbeat thing. How about that? So let's throw some, some beatbox. So we got beatbox. Let's throw a little. All right, happy. That feels kind of happy, right? Let's do another little guitar. Bit. All right, we gotta get some vocals in there, so maybe maybe TED Talk on a Sunday? I don't know, let's throw that in there. Give it a TED Talk on a Sunday, hey, hey, hey. Give it a TED Talk on a Sunday, hey, hey, hey. Give it a TED Talk on a Sunday, hey, hey, hey. Give it a TED Talk on a Sunday, We'll mute that for a little second. Little tambourine, never heard it. Maybe 
maybe some, uh, we need, we've got almost everything there, but there's one thing. So that's, <laughs> thanks. so that's live looping, right? Now, I want to deconstruct that a little bit. I'm going to show you exactly what's going on, because one thing I noticed every time I had to make a big decision in my life, uh, especially with regards to my family, because that meant a lot more. I had more to lose, right? So I noticed that every time I threw myself into a situation, even though I wasn't prepared for it, I just found a way to do something. You can't just sit there and you're not just going to sink, right? You're going to have to swim. And we've all heard that and we all get that. But it's funny when you can actually tap into moments of your life and think about every massively bad thing that's ever happened to me. Yes, there's been some chaos, right? We've all, we've all dealt with that. But we're, I'm foolish not to acknowledge that if that hadn't happened, then X, Y, Z etc. wouldn't have happened, right? And who am I to change the past? All I can do is focus on that and use that energy and push it into the future. And so every time that happened and I was able to use my flexibility and my uh, agility and my adaptation muscle, right? I got better at it and better at it. And I thought, you know what? I loop. <laughs> I used to play in bands. And yeah, this is lonelier than a band. <laughs> but it's cheaper than a band. Um, it's a little bit more adaptable than a band. And I can stand on the stage and I can do things that bands can't do. Yes, they can do a lot of things that I can't do. But I'm not trying to compete with bands. I'm trying to compete with, with the adaptation of standing on a stage and trying to be unique and trying to really live in the present moment. And so let me show you. I'll break this down. So for those who don't know what live looping is, you just kind of saw it. Most of you have probably seen Ed Sheeran and other artists around do this. But it's where you record everything live on stage. So I have four tracks that I can record. So four band members, not including myself, on the stage. And band member number one has beatbox and has some guitar on here. So, And I can stop band member number one and start them up again, right? So number two. I have all the harmonies. Let's talk on a Sunday. Hey, hey, hey. So there's four vocals there that I stacked. Then uh, track number three, band member number three, is all the little kind of Dr. Dre two note keys <laughs> thing that I tried to do. Dr. Dre with a tambourine in his hand playing them. Keys. And then uh, track number four is the bass and the drums some random grunts of me going, uh, uh. it's very important. <laughs> so the thing about live looping on, and this was quite a quick example, but I've got, I've got 18 tracks that I recorded really quickly. Not to mention, I was also playing an extra one and I was singing an extra one. So that's 20 things that I can contribute to by myself on the stage, provided I don't take 14 minutes to set the whole thing up. <laughs> But uh, when, when you're able to do this, you can be extremely adaptable. But there's a big element of somebody said happy song, uh, 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 happy chords. <laughs> That's all I could do is just jump in and try and play some happy chords and acknowledge that I have a reaction with me being able to play a guitar and have played guitar for years now that I'm going to land on some appropriate chords, right? And so the same deal with all of this, I've got 20, 20 tracks, but I don't have to nail every single one of them. As long as I get the majority, it's going to sound okay. You don't hear that the third vocal that I put down was a little bit flat, <laughs> and the fact that I put, when, when I put the bass line down, I, uh, I was really late on the second last note. I can hear it because I put it down like that, but I'm like, quick, put something better over it, right? So as long as you land, is what I'm trying to say, everything's going to be okay. So with all that said, I'm going to finish with one song, finish playing this song. Uh, actually, I'm going to delete this whole thing. 
I'm going to play an actual song that I wrote. It's called One Night Wonder. And it directly relates to uh, basically shrugging off the things that don't matter and doubling down on the things that do. You're in charge of your own happiness. And one, one little piece, one little nugget I want to remind myself when I watch this later and also to you is you're more adaptable than you think you are. So please throw yourself in or allow yourself to be thrown and live loop your life. <laughs> Let's play this. By the way, is anybody named Becky? No? <laughs> Good. Good. Because <laughs> in this song, <laughs> in this song, Becky, we're talking about things that happen to us that we can shrug off or adapt with, right? But in this song, Becky shows up. We're having a good time. I'm playing ping pong. I'm winning. It's great. And then Becky shows up with a boyfriend, Brad, took my drink, and then left with Chad. But Becky was a buzzkill anyway. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'll call out everything that I'm doing as I'm looping this. And uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Let's get some beatbox here. All right, drums. All right, a little guitar bit here. We'll throw that in. So. I'm standing by the pool So I dive in with my clothes on Now my phone's dead, but it's a no one It takes more than that to bring me down So I'm not gonna let it get in the way of a good time Not gonna let it kill my vibe Got everything I need by my side Hi. Let it be another one night wonder None of us are gonna get any younger Some of the best days go down in the summer, so let it be another one night wonder. 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 It's Becky's verse. F -f 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 Fold that ping pong table in the room. I was spinning serves and couldn't lose Until Becky shows up with a boyfriend Brad Took my drink and then left with Chad Becky was a buzzkill anyway So I'm not gonna let it get in the way of a good time Not gonna let it kill my vibe Got everything I need by my side Ha! Let her be another one night wonder None of us are gonna get any younger Some of the best days go down in the summer So let it be another one night wonder